political landscape has been obviously, uh, in many ways, for all of us, the issue of this year. We have gone through an election. <laughs> one one day, we'll find out who won. Uh, and what the official results were and who's going to be our government and who's going to be there. But it won't be this week. It'll be today week. We'll finally find out, which is simply ridiculous. But in the meantime, um, uh, New Zealand politics is something, or the reform of New Zealand politics and the way in which we run politics in this country is going to be a big issue. For many of us, we've felt that the bureaucracy in Wellington uh, have been running this country for the last oh, certainly five, six, maybe ten years, probably longer than that if you're really honest about it, uh, and that they have increasingly got out of touch, well-paid, university-educated civil servants um, with a policy agenda that is radical in comparison to the rest of New Zealand um, and unrepresentative of it. And really that is the so-called independent and impartial uh, civil service or bureaucracy that the incoming government will inherit. Um, something or a bureaucracy that good parts of and good senior parts of are inherently opposed to the policy agenda of that incoming government. What is the future of government in this country? Uh, what really is going to be the future of politics in this country? Joining us to talk about that um, is the Chief Executive or the Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative, Oliver Hartwich. Uh, Dr. Oliver Hartwich, good, welcome to the show. Good to have you on again. Good morning, Michael. Great to be with you again. Oliver, just um, quickly tell us again, New Zealand Initiative, what is it? What is it? We are a think tank and we are a membership organisation. So we are supported by a broad range of businesses in New Zealand, but we're working not as a lobby group, but as a think tank, meaning we're looking at the issues that we think are important for the future of this country. We're trying to make New Zealand a better country for all its people. And that means we're looking into issues as separate and dis disparate as education, housing, local government, and really anything that we think is of importance for the future of this country. Now, you're primarily, um, I imagine, an empirically based organisation, are you? So when you look at policies, you don't look at it from an ideological perspective. You say, does this work? Yes, we we're looking at um, whether solutions work. We are definitely doing empirical work, but we're also looking at it from various perspectives. So in our team, we currently have um, quite a few economists, obviously, because we are heavily economics focused, but we also have a psychologist working on education policy. We have a political scientist um, looking at uh, the state of our tertiary education institutions. And we've got a historian here who's currently fo focusing on the history of infrastructure in this country. So we're looking at it from quite a broad range of perspectives. Okay, now, um, as you would have heard my introduction and, said, and particularly over the last five or six years, there has been a growing centralisation of power in this country. Um, I've certainly experienced as a local government elected official that all the policy has been driven out of Wellington rather than driven locally. Um, I think that's been a common refrain um, throughout most of New Zealand and one of the great complaints is that Wellington, which has a culture that is different than New Zealand, classically illustrated, I would have thought, on election night, um, is imposing uh, from a top down um, a, a, a policy prescription and regime upon all of New Zealand and that has not gone down well. Uh, and the, your, you wrote an article earlier this week for the New Zealand Herald uh, in which you looked at the incoming government and sort of tested that thesis. Can you explain, um, and you suggested that what now seems to be required is not uh, so much the centralisation of the administration of government in this country, but a return to localism. Can you give us uh, exactly what you mean by that? Well, what I did for the article was I was just trying to figure out whether the three parties likely to end up in government together, so National Act, New Zealand First, have much in common. And I don't mean specific policies on which they can agree, but more broadly, do they share a common outlook on politics? Do they have a philosophy that binds them together? And at first sight, you wouldn't think so because they're quite different. I mean, National is the kind of typical non-committal centre-right party, if you like. Then we've got ACT as a libertarian party in New Zealand First World with elements of populism um, hard to actually put on a political spectrum. So I was wondering, is there anything that binds them together ideologically? And I think there is one thing, actually, that all three parties have in common, 
and that is localism. Now we have to define what we mean by that. Localism as the idea that local communities are usually better placed to deal with their own issues rather than distant bureaucrats somewhere in Wellington. Uh, you can also have different names for that. You could call it subsidiarity. You could call it decentralization. But essentially, it's always the same idea. We want to make sure that um, political decisions are taken bottom up rather than top down. And when you look through the statements of the party leaders, when you look through the party's manifestos, you can see that we find traces, quite big traces actually, of localism in all three of them. And so, just to take you through, for example, when you go through the New Zealand First Manifesto, you find passages actually saying, we've had enough of Wellington, basically, and we want to actually bring decision-making back down to the people, so that's clear localism. Mm. They have concrete proposals where they say, when it comes to minerals royalties, for example, they should be shared with the local community. They might actually just stay there rather than going up Wellington. You get the ACT Party and you find something very similar there. So ACT has um, previously advocated for taking the GST revenue from new development, residential development, and give it to local councils so that they have a chance to finance the infrastructure that they need to make the development happen. And then if you look at uh, the National Party, Chris Luxon talks a lot about localism. He talks a lot about the trips he's been on with the New Zealand Initiative, actually, to Switzerland and Denmark, where he could see very decentralized decision-making in practice. And Luxon likes this kind of approach. So there you have it. You have the three parties now singing from the same hymn sheet when it comes to devolution or localism or subsidiarity or decentralization, whatever you want to call it. But they're actually quite aligned on that. And also what's interesting is this really goes against at least the last six years of government because under Labour, of course, we got the opposite. That was a government that centralized everything that stood in its way. Think of Free Waters, where we took the assets from councils and actually aggregated them. Or think about the um, health system, where we now have a national health system, where previously we had district health boards. I'm not saying that they work particularly well, but it was centralization. <laughs> they did the same with the politics. So the politics got centralized into something that's now called Tepukinga and doesn't work. So this last government, or this still existing government, actually was one of the most centralizing forces we've had in New Zealand for quite some time. And against that, the new three parties forming the next government, they will probably do the very opposite. And I think that's a positive step forward. Um, yes, it's interesting, though, because at the end of the day, um, I'm not an ideologue. Uh, I don't know if you are, Oliver, but ultimately, at the end of the day, I'm always a whatever works person. Um, you'd have to look, wouldn't you, at something like, well, let's just try the health sector and say there was a bit of a postcode stuff going on in the country. Um, there wasn't a rational um, allocation of resources. There was very little cooperation. Indeed, there was competition between those DHBs. They became incredibly um, management heavy. Um, mm -hmm. So... Is is it is localism necessarily a good thing? Well, let's put it this way. I don't think we'll get any less bureaucracy now that the health system is centralized. I totally agree with you. We had some real serious issues in the health system with the DHBs, but I predict that none of them will be solved by more centralization and just a kind of relabeling of the bureaucracy. So uh, this centralization doesn't work. So your question is whether localism works. Well, I think in many cases, localism will work. But in this case, specifically in health, the question should be, does centralization get us to where we need to be? And there the answer is most emphatically not. So I think localism generally works when you align incentives when you with um, revenue and with uh, political tasks, and you want to make sure that councils actually face the full costs and benefits of their decision-making rather than just benefits or just costs. And in that sense, for example, if you want to solve the housing crisis, localism is essential because currently what we do in New Zealand, we tell councils, can you please make sure that we zone enough for, for development and can you make sure that the development happens? But then when the development happens and taxes are generated out of that development, like GSD, like income taxes, like corporate taxes, they end up in Wellington. So actually we've got this complete mismatch between responsibilities and funding. 
And I think that is the issue that localism has to fix. And I think on that, the three parties are very much aligned. Mm. Can I take you to another example, though, uh, which I think, in fact, centralism is required in actual fact and that localism has gone too far. I'm thinking specifically of compulsory education in this country, um, the years 1 to 13, where we now know that New Zealand's had declining educational standards now for quite some time. And one of the bugbears or one of the key uh, drivers of that does appear to be that schools can interpret a curriculum. Indeed, individual school teachers can interpret a curriculum um, without any significant definition as to what they can teach, when they teach it, how they teach it or anything like that. Isn't there an argument for centralism to try and drive up New Zealand's educational standards? Yes, I think there is an argument. And I agree with you that the current curriculum uh, doesn't work because it is not specific at all. The current document runs over just a bit more than 40 pages for all subjects and all years of school. Mm. So nothing gets properly defined. And then we are relying on schools to interpret that curriculum and, and, and make it their own. And it doesn't work. It's a recipe for disaster. So I'm very much in favor of a more prescriptive curriculum actually laying out in great detail what we expect schools to teach and students to learn. So on that front, I'm totally with you. That said, I think, um, again, it is good that we have a relatively decentralized school system where the schools are at least partially self-managing. I mean, the idea behind tomorrow schools was an even greater degree of self-management. I mean, talk bulk funding, for example. Um, but I think that's a good thing. And actually, it's, it's also one of those areas in which a bit of local decision-making sometimes makes things better. So from our research here at the initiative, we often see schools performing relatively well when they just ignore whatever comes out of the Ministry of Education here in Wellington. So um, a, a bit of local decision-making can be a good thing.